Ian Duncan Smith, serving in the forces or leading a political party, which is the most stressful? Well, I think leading the political party was because uh, as somebody once said to Churchill, oh, well, this House of Commons is a great place because uh, here are, are, are your party and over the op other side are the, op are the opposition. He said, no, 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 over there is the Labour Party, over here is the opposition. And that's exactly what it is, really. It's like that. You never, you're judged the whole time. Opposition is the worst kind of leadership because nobody wants to be led. They're all fed up and angry. They all want to tell you what to do. Uh, and it's like herding cats, really, I guess. So apart from that, it was probably OK, really. <laughs> but you talk about that, that being um, a sign of being in opposition. But actually, there's very little discipline in your party in government, certainly of late. Um, three different prime ministers in as many months quite a sort of rebellious group of MPs. How, how did we get to this point? Yes, it's, it's interesting. I come back to the, uh, to the COVID lockdowns. I think they've affected absolutely everything in British life. In fact, everywhere, probably, if you look around what's going on in other countries. But here, within our system, what's happened is we had a 2019 intake, many of whom probably weren't expecting to be elected, big majority, uh, only immediately they come into Parliament, we lock down, so they're out of Parliament. So pretty much for two, two and a bit years, they didn't really learn anything about what you do in Parliament, how it works, the structure, how the discipline works, as and when it does. So I found when they came back, they were on a, a fast learning curve. But at the same time, we were in difficulty and now they're worrying about their seats, which often were quite difficult to hold anyway. So I think the, the nature of discipline had broken down quite significantly uh, and opposition... Sometimes the discipline comes when there's a whiff of a chance that you're going to get in, then that brings people together. But in government, uh, if it looks like you, you might possibly lose, then that, if it wasn't strong already, then starts to disintegrate. And I think, uh, as I say, COVID, I think, has affected everything. It's affected our politics. It's affected the nature of how we run our parties. All of this is, um, has gone through a period which I've never I've seen before in my life. Interesting that you talk about discipline as well, because some people listening to Indigo Smith talk about discipline mm -hmm. will say, well, hang on a minute. I mean, he defied, started defying the party whip pretty much as soon as he got elected, continued to do so when he served in David Cameron's cabinet. You resigned. So actually, I, I was going to ask you, but maybe this is the wrong question. I was going to ask you if discipline is an overrated virtue in politics. Well, uh, discipline is uh, uh, important inside political parties. You have to, if you're a government, you have to get your business through. It's a little, uh, little more difficult in opposition where you're not actually pushing anything particularly. Um, yeah, no, I, uh, you know, I disagreed with the Maastricht Treaty on arrival, so uh, I ended up rebelling. It's not how I planned my political life, I have to tell you. Um, I, uh, I pick my issues, but uh, the realities in politics, I think it's important that you do occasionally, if you want, rebel. I think there's nothing uh, less interesting than somebody who never rebels in the whole of their life and then goes through rising without trace to the extent that they end up being in power. I never think that's particularly exciting. I mean, all the great leaders were rebelling at some stage. So um, the real point here, I think, is that uh, you pick your rebellions and you don't do too much at once. I mean, Churchill's great dictum was never more than one rebellion at a time, which for him <laughs> was quite interesting. But um, so that's really how I think it works. So I don't, I don't resile from that. I simply say that if there are big issues and you feel strongly about them, and if you think the government's going the wrong way, then you have to decide whether or not your country comes before your allegiance to your government. And that's always the choice. So I don't pretend to lecture anybody about discipline by any means at all, though I was pretty, uh, pretty strong and supportive of the government that I was in as uh, uh, Secretary of State for Work and Pensions. My rebellion at the end of that was because I simply fundamentally disagreed with the government in the extent of their reductions on benefits, and I thought they'd gone too far. You've seen a lot of Labour leaders in your time. Mm. Kinnock, Smith, Blair, Brown, Ed Miliband, Jeremy Corbyn, Keir Starmer. Who have you feared most? Uh, I, well, it's clearly Blair was the most successful of the group that you've named. Um, and I guess in that sense, uh, when, I was <coughs> when I was in opposition uh, after he had got uh, elected in 97, because I came in in 92, so he got elected in 97 with a landslide, um, it was tough for opposition. They didn't want to hear from us. And yes. uh, he, of course, managed to speak, you know, to cover both political parts of the spectrum in a way that found, I found very frustrating. Uh, but it was a skill. Uh, a skill, by the way, which I think his party has never quite understood or recognised properly or even 
uh, sort of thanked him for, because it was a remarkable transformation, but not just transformation, the fact that he kept it afloat, considering all the pressures that come from them. Uh, you know, on the other side, with Jeremy Corbyn later, shows you the distinct difference between elements of the Labour Party, as much, well, more so than there are on the Conservative Party in many ways. But um, so, so I thought he's probably the one that was the most successful, but also the one that the Conservatives must have feared most, and certainly I thought we needed to come to terms with what he was actually doing, rather than moaning and complaining that somehow he'd stolen our clothes, which was a mistake, really. Um, some of your former colleagues, Anna Seabury, Claire Perry, uh, both former Conservative ministers, they've been very warm about Keir Starmer as a sort of grandee in the Conservative Party. Is it your advice to just take those sort of things on the chin? When, when, when former colleagues praise opposition leaders, do you engage with it? Do you take it on the chin? No, I, well, I don't engage with it. I mean, you know, the, the uh, important word there is former. Uh, you know, it's, it's really important when they're sitting in the House with you uh, because that is a potential vote or a potential support or whatever. My general view is respect who the opposition leader is, uh, respect that they may be doing uh, quite a good job, uh, and make sure that what you're trying to do is to do the right thing in government, but at the same time recognising at times you'll have to block off elements that the opposition has got something right on. Uh, and that's important. Blair was very quick about that when he was in his period uh, uh, opposing John Major. Uh, you know, anything half decent they took, and the rest of the time they spent pointing out just how hopeless John Major was. So, I mean, that's the classic way to run opposition. So you got lots of people coming out and saying they thought Blair was okay, etc. The key thing is to focus on why you want to be in government. I always think the problem for a government sometimes they want to be in government, they never quite actually understand why they want to be in government. You have to have a clear agenda for change and sometimes changing what you've already governed is the toughest thing altogether, to admit that mistakes have been made, things haven't gone right. We're in that sort of saga right now. Uh, but. Um, uh, yeah, I think uh, former co colleagues have the luxury uh, of always being right. It's not the rest of us who actually are practitioners uh, ever have the problem of. What's the biggest mistake that your party has made in the, what, 12 years of government, in your view? Well, I think the biggest, the latest is the biggest mistake we've made is having voted for Brexit, having led to Brexit, having got elected with a landslide to deliver Brexit, uh, we haven't delivered it in the way that we should have done. Uh, there's no point in leaving the European Union if you then parallel the European Union because you might as well have been in it. Uh, my answer is always things like regulations, things like changes that are huge and could be very big, we should have got on with straight away, notwithstanding the fact we've hit the worst crisis that any government has hit since the Second World War, which is COVID, which has killed millions, leveled governments down to uh, incompetence, etc. But we still had that underlying agenda, which to deliver the benefits of Brexit, which is flexibility, the ability to do our own things, to change the regulations, so financial services, etc., could run much more smoothly. And by the way, there is a huge potential industry hit sitting here in the UK, which could dominate the world, and that's medtech. Uh, I've spoken to scientists who did the delivery of the vaccines, who realised, having voted Remain, that leaving actually helped them because we were able to make those regulation changes specifically for them. And they've said, this is it. This is the biggest industry that's going to grow. It could be dominant, bigger than financial services. But we need, they've said, regulatory change to be able to define the market. Absolutely. Two years ago, I wrote a report for the government on this. For two years, next to nothing has been done. Everyone's distracted. But this alone could be so important to the UK that every scientific group, every medical company would come to the UK to do their development because they could use anonymized, anonymized data from the health service, which is a huge resource, potentially giving the health service more money. All of these things are net positive, but it takes change. Uh, if we're going to be outside the EU, then we can't be the EU. We have to be the UK. Let me ask you about the incident that <clears throat> took place at Conservative Conference last mm. year. Um, just to quote your own words back, I got a traffic cone slammed onto my head, got three quarters of the way across the street you were crossing. I felt this blow on the back of my head and neck. There was no punishment for the man accused of doing that. How did you and your wife react to that news? Well, we were concerned because uh, it was a clear case in, within criminal law. Uh, they were charged with quite a, a low-level charge anyway. Um, 
but the person that was uh, in charge of the case said that he thought it clashed with Article 10, their rights to protest. Now, every single KC that I've spoken to, many in the House of Commons, on both sides of the House, by the way, and colleagues on both sides of the House, have all said uh, Article 10 does not allow violent action. It's never seen. It's the right to protest, but it's when it goes past a protest. Uh, so we were intrigued. I gather that the, uh, I understand that the uh, um, CPS is going to uh, appeal this, as it were, or go back to the High Court on it. So I don't know what the outcomes, and I can't comment therefore further than that. But I do know that every, as one MP, a Labour MP, came to me and said, well, we're all targets now, aren't we? And given that this was weeks before the murder uh, that took place of our, one of our colleagues, that um, I just find it a remarkable judgment. But then, you know, I'm... It's not my job to change the judgment, but it is the job of the criminal prosecution service. But it was a pretty angry and violent nonsense. These were permanent protesters. They do nothing else but protest. One of them, which they couldn't prove who it was, uh, attacked me by slamming a very heavy cone, which has grit inside it and everything else. I wasn't really worried for myself, generally wasn't. It was my wife and her friend who were next to me, who were genuinely frightened. Uh, and we literally scurried into the uh, system after that. And my wife said, oh, this is terrible, terrible. And she was quite upset. Um, and I think that's not a right to protest. It goes beyond that. And it doesn't matter whether you're Labour or Conservative. As my colleagues have all just said, agreed with me that this is something that needs to be sorted out. Um, let's, you mentioned your wife there. Let's talk about something happier. Uh, you married um, Elizabeth Betsy in 1982. <laughs> so you'll have just celebrated, what's that, 40, 40 years of marriage. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> she must have been there as your confidant yeah. and your advisor throughout that time. Can you think of the best piece of advice she has given to you? How can I describe it, really? Just uh, being there sometimes is important because uh, you will recall <coughs> there are times when you just need someone to listen. Uh, and uh, when I was a leader, it was really tough. Uh, but she was always ready. She, I used to speak to her. I had had this thing about speaking to my wife every, at least if I'm away, speaking to her every single night, one way or the other, just talking, you know, about things that she's done, things that I've done during the course of the day. Uh, and it's that which is really important. And being a real steady, a steady influence, really, sometimes just being able to say, well, I'm sure this will go away, or that will not be a problem, or you know, every now and then when you spark off in a bit of anger and it just simply says you shouldn't be quite snappy like that or whatever, or if I've said something to somebody and you'll say, I think you could have done better than that. Uh, your best critic is the person closest to you. Uh, the best thing she ever does is not pat me on the back saying how wonderful I was, which doesn't happen, by the way, very often. Uh, the best criticism is when she says, I think... I think you didn't do yourself very well on that one occasion and you have to take it because she knows you better than you know yourself. Great to discuss your life and times. Uh, decades in politics, leadership positions, rebelling. There's a lot to go through. Thank you for sharing your life and times, Ian Duncan-Smith. My pleasure.